Hey, everybody. Welcome. My name is Matt Nightingale, and I am the founder and executive director of a new nonprofit called Common Sanctuary. And one of the things that we love to do in our work is to feature conversations at the intersection of LGBTQ and Christianity. Um, we want to foster healthy conversations at that intersection. And we've had a couple of conversations already over the last couple of months. We talked with Tony Gapastone and Scott Austin, both straight pastors who have become affirming of queer identities and relationships and talked about their story. We talked to Reverend Mary Nichols, who lost her credentials because she was affirming of queer people. And we learned about how to how to be a good ally. And today I'm really excited because um, I'm going to be interviewing an amazing man named Reverend Steve Peters. And if you have seen the movie or even heard of the movie, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, uh, he was featured in that movie. And uh, we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Um, but I just want to say thanks for joining us. Um, we are streaming live on Facebook and on YouTube. And we'll um, be able to see your comments. So please check in and say hello. Um, and then toward the end of our conversation, uh, we'll be taking your questions and Steve will be answering them. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Steve into the stream. Hello, Steve. Hi, how are you, Matt? I'm doing well. It's really sure. fun to finally be face to face with you. We've been chatting a little bit on on social media and uh, via email, but it's it's great to see your face this afternoon. So thanks well, for being be here. here. Thanks for having me. So the the reason that you're getting all kinds of attention right now is because of this brand new movie, The Eyes of Tammy yeah. Faye. Um, and for those who haven't seen it, um, the the movie is really the story of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and the PTL Club and the kind of the 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 ascendance in the mm -hmm. '80s and then the scandals and all of that. But one of the moments that that was featured in this film is a, a time in 1985 when Tammy Faye Baker was, she had a show called Tammy's House Party. I love that, that show name. And on Tammy's House Party, she interviewed in 1985, this is unprecedented at the time, she interviewed a young gay Christian man who had been diagnosed with AIDS and she had him uh, live via satellite on this uh, PTL network television program called Tammy's House Party. And she interviewed this guy. And this guy is sitting right here now, Reverend Steve Peters, all these years later. Um, tell us what you remember about that day. The day of the interview? Yeah. Tell us oh, how, well, how did uh, that happen and, and what was it like for you? Well, the, uh, they had, had searched for a a gay man with AIDS who was willing to go on and talk with Tammy on her show all over the East and mm. South, and they hadn't found anybody. And they finally talked to a friend of mine who who was the executive director of the AIDS Project in Atlanta, okay. Reverend Kent South, and he uh, referred them to me, thinking I might do, be a good one for them to interview. And I had already been doing a lot of interviews about having AIDS and, and prior to that about being gay. Okay. Uh, I had been a gay pastor for many years for mm -hmm. well, eight or nine at that point. And, okay. uh, and so I agreed to go on as long as it was done live. And mm. they said, Oh, of course, of course, we're always live, you know, for the Tammy South party. So anyway, so the, uh, I was supposed to fly there. They actually sent me two first-class plane tickets to Charlotte. And uh, um, I, I, I was very weak, very mm -hmm. sick at the time mm -hmm. uh, from an experimental chemotherapy. And so um, I had a companion who was going to go with me. And uh, she came to my house, and we were walking out the door to the airport when when uh, Tammy's producer called and said, don't come, mm. uh, Tammy's sick, we're canceling the show, send us back the tickets. And uh, and so we did, we, and we were very disappointed mm. thinking the interview wasn't gonna happen. Well, the next day the producer called back and said, Tammy's feeling better. <laughs> and so uh, we wanna do the show, but we're gonna have you go to a, a, a studio in Ontario, uh, mm not Canada, Ontario, California. Right. And uh, about an hour and a half from my home. And uh, and so I sat in a dark studio 
uh, with a camera with a red light on it uh, and an earpiece, mm -hmm. which of course saw me almost lose mm -hmm. uh, and in the interview. And, um, and we talked, through, Tammy and I talked for like three minutes before the interview and she was just so sweet and so supportive, mm -hmm. loving and caring and, and I knew it was going to be just fine. And it, mm -hmm. was, it went, uh, you know, uh, for, I do remember coming home from it thinking that I'd done a terrible job. Oh, wow. I, I wish I'd said this and I wish I hadn't said that. And I wish I'd put this differently. And, you know, mm -hmm. all the, all the second guessing that, that we preachers tend to do about our, uh, our performances as it were. Right. And I remember telling uh, my neighbor who came over to hear all about what it was like to talk with Tammy Faye. And uh, I, I remember telling her, it, I did a terrible job. I'm so glad no one I know will ever see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that didn't turn out quite that way. But uh, so that's how it happened. Um, and it was a great 24 minutes. I, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed my time with her. And, you know, the conversation was, I mean, the questions were <sighs> They, I, I've shown the video many, many times as I've traveled around the world teaching and preaching about AIDS. Yeah. And um, and I always hear comments like, oh my God, how could she ask such stupid questions? But they weren't stupid or silly or any of mm -hmm. that. They were the right questions for her evangelical audience. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, I was struck. I, I watched it just before uh, talking to you this afternoon. And um, one of the things that really struck me, yes, there were some like, I don't know, naive questions, right? But but I, I think they came from a place of genuine curiosity and genuine kindness. Yes. I was cracking up when she's saying, are, are you sure you just, you know, haven't tried girls? Like maybe haven't what if you just tried girls? Try. Right. Yeah. I know. And and I, the, the thing that I said, I think at that point was, well, um, no, I never, I didn't, I, I never had, I never did because I thought it would be disrespectful to the mm -hmm. woman yep. and, and, uh, Troy Perry, the founder and moderator of, of the MCC denomination, um, told me, uh, later, much later, many years later <laughs> that, uh, that he knew that the Holy spirit was working in the interview mm -hmm. when I said that, because, I I had never said anything like that before, yeah. and, and it and he said it was the perfect phrase for mm -hmm. her audience. Yeah, here. Yeah, um, I I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Um, one of the things too that just I, I, I was so struck by watching this interview, and it's a it's an old interview now, 1985. Yeah. Um, but I, I was really I was struck by how you were able to speak truth to this large evangelical audience um and and you said things that she didn't try to correct you or fix you at all right you right. said things like you you very clearly said aids is not a judgment on on gay people you right. know you you just stated that very boldly and you said god created me this way i mean you you asserted some very strong statements for an evangelical audience and she just kind of went along with it yeah. and, then, and then even more so i loved it when she said you know she asked you if you're afraid of dying right and you said no and and she said well all i know is that only a real christian could answer like that you know yeah. so it was like the spirit in her recognized the spirit in you and she just said it so plainly like i i see you as a yeah. christian and that that's kind of mind-blowing for 1985 on the ptl yeah. network I know, you know, and the one of the things that I said that was actually quoted in the movie uh, that she did not, you know, try to correct was I, I said, yeah, Jesus loves me just the way mm. I am. Jesus yeah. loves the way I love. Yes, yes. Uh, and and um, they they quoted that directly in the movie. And, and uh, uh, oh, my God, you know, that was like, slap in the face of most evangelicals because right. they did not believe that, mm -hmm. um, particularly in 1985. There right. was very, very little tolerance of gay men, and particularly because of AIDS, right. it was so associated with gay men. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, and AIDS, you know, so I, I, 
I had been making it my message uh, in interviews for several years at that point that AIDS was not God's punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of, you know, was like falling off a log. But, uh, right. and, and I had been very clear with her producer beforehand that I didn't want to be trapped into a, well, if you'd only accept Jesus the way mm. that I know Jesus, uh, then yeah. you would you would be saved, and you mm. would, because I am I know Jesus. I am yeah. a Christian. Mm -hmm. I I I am a gay Christian. I'm a queer Christian, yeah. and uh, that's just fine. Mm -hmm. So, so that interview happened in 1985. Yeah. Then many years later, the year 2000 comes this documentary called The Eyes of Tammy Faye. And I remember hearing about it when it first came out. This was narrated by RuPaul. And, uh, and, and it was so interesting because it kind of told a little bit of a redemption story. After the Tammy Faye and Jim Baker scandals, Tammy had kind of a second act and, uh, and you know, started going to gay pride parades, became somewhat of a gay icon and a, and a very vocal and outspoken ally. So what was it like for you when that movie came out in 2000, that documentary started, you know, hitting the, the film festival circuits and, yeah. and you probably got some attention back then too? No, I really didn't. Um, really? It wasn't, I didn't, I didn't. Uh, I mean, I saw the movie and mm -hmm. it was kind of surreal to see myself on film there uh, in the, in the, you know, where they use the interview. Right. Um, and I knew that the movie was going to happen because one of the executive producers uh, had called me and asked my permission to use the video, uh, and I said, "Sure, why not?" You know, and I and I didn't know who the hell this executive producer was. Uh, you know, I didn't know whether he was going to make a legitimate film or not. Right. Uh, but but you know, the video is out there, uh, mm -hmm. and it's part of the record. So right. yeah, go ahead and use it. Um, and and uh, you know, I did not hear a lot of feedback about it or anything. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I know a lot of people saw it and have yeah. seen it since in on DVD or Blu-ray or something. Mm -hmm. But um, no, it wasn't a it wasn't a big turning point in my life. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then comes twenty twenty one. Right. And now that this was a big maybe deal. a bigger deal. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about what it's been like for you since this movie has been in production. Well, I didn't know that it was being filmed when mm -hmm. they were filming it. Um, it was only after they had finished filming and were in post production that um, my friend Jay Baker, uh, mm -hmm. Jim and Tammy's son, yeah. uh, told me that uh, Jessica Chastain was making this movie, or had, you know, that it had been filmed and and COVID was delaying the release and oh, okay. production of it and all that. But uh, uh, and and that my uh, interview was central to the film. Hmm. So uh, at the prodding of a good friend of mine who is in show business. Uh, she, um, uh, you know, she just kept nagging me to write the studio and tell them, hey, I'm still alive, you know, <laughs> and uh, they didn't know I was still alive, which is why nobody sought me out. Randy Havens, who plays me, mm. uh, did not seek me out or okay. talk to me or anything. Uh, and uh, uh, and Jessica uh, was so excited that I made contact with them. She she would private tweet me. Uh, things like, you know, I decided to do the movie because of your interview with Tammy Faye. Wow. And, and uh, uh, I mean, it was all just terribly exciting. And then the interviews started happening. And um, I got interviewed. I was interviewed by any. I mean, it seemed like I was doing four. I was doing four or five interviews a week. Yeah. For several months there. And um, uh, it was very exciting and very affirming and, mm. and all of that. So. Yeah. Tell us about the 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 movie premiere in the red carpet. Ah, that. well, you know, I I I was not sure that they would invite me, but they did, and they flew me to New York, and uh, you know, I had limos picking me up and taking me everywhere from my home to the airport to the airport to the hotel, everywhere, wow. and it was just you know fabulous, um, and the and my niece 
came as my plus one. Mm. Uh, I was invited to in, uh, invite two other people and my literary agent and and uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, uh, joined us that evening. The red carpet was actually a hot pink carpet. So it's very <laughs> appropriate for Tammy Faye. Perfect. And, um, uh, you know, I, I appeared in front of the paparazzi and, you know, they're all, and uh, they all seemed to know who I was. I, but I realized later that it was because they all had press packets that had, <laughs> had a little bio of me in it. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, they, they all took my picture and then I was hanging out on the carpet and uh, over on the end of the red carpet towards the entrance. And, and there was a tap on my shoulder and I turned around and saw this huge, tall man start standing in front of me. And he said, Reverend Peters, I want to introduce myself. I'm Vincent D'Onofrio and I play Jerry Falwell in the film, but I have to tell you, I saw your interview years ago and I have followed your ministry ever since. I, and he was just so complimentary. Mm -hmm. And then the publicist, uh, for one of the publicists on the film came to me and said, Jessica wants to meet you now. And so she was down at the other end of the carpet with the paparazzi and, and I said, oh, okay. And uh, uh, so I started over and the publicist pointed me out to Jessica because I look a little different than I did 35, 36 years ago. We all do. It's okay. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, so she pointed me out and Jessica went, oh, and she ran to me and threw herself in my arms and, and just hugged me tight for about 30, 40 seconds, it seemed. And, mm -hmm. and she just kept whispering in my ear. You're extraordinary. Do you know that you are living history? Oh my God, I am so thrilled to meet you. And I, I mean, she just was, you know, compliment after compliment, and, um, and uh, uh, it was was really amazing. And then she turned, she the hug ended, and she turned to the paparazzi and said, "Do you know who this is?" <laughs> and I went, "Yes, it's Reverend Peters." You know, and. Uh, and uh, she was just so delightful. We danced at the at the after party, and mm. uh, it was a lot of fun. I loved in the uh, closing credits of the film. You know, they bring up the actor's photo, and then they bring up your photo, and it's like he's still alive. They they put on, you know, they wrote on the screen that you're still alive and well, and and I know. all these years, I, and people clapped in the in the screening that I was in. Oh, was really? really cool. Oh, they cla yeah. they clapped at the opening too, mm. and I, which surprised me enormously. Yeah. But Jessica told me later that every screening she'd been to, the audience always applauded when yeah. my, my photo went up. Yeah, alongside. that happened right here in Santa Rosa, California. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, That's it was cool. great. So I, um, you know, as I was preparing for this conversation today, I, I purchased this book that you wrote back in 1991 right. called I'm right. Still Dancing, A Gay Man's Health Experience. And uh yeah, it, it was interesting. I read the whole thing, and, it, and a lot of it is um, kind of journal entries from your very first years uh, of of living with AIDS. Yeah. Um, and one one thing stood out to me. I thought I'd read it really quickly. Okay. This is um, written in December of 1984, so even before the the interview on the PTL Club. You said, "So how long do I have to live? Do I know on some deep spiritual level? Not that I'm aware of at this point. Sometimes I sense that I have about a year left." But I have felt that ever since the terminal diagnosis. A expecting at least a year helps prevent me from feeling that this is my very last summer, my last Halloween, my last Christmas. So I always give myself at least a year. And I could very well be one of those to live with this thing and survive it. I might very well survive AIDS and die of pastoral exhaustion in the pulpit at age 87. <laughs> I just loved that because yeah. here you are. I mean, this was 1991. You, you right. wrote that in 1984. It was published in 91. And then here you are in 2021. Who could have imagined um, that you could have survived all these years? What an incredible story. I know. I, I, I'm astounded by it myself. I, I you know, and, and it's just amazing to still be here. Each new birthday is a triumph. Mm -hmm. You know, I have friends who, uh, you know, my peers who, when they turn 69, I'm 69 now, okay. when they turn 65, you know, they were going, oh my God, I'm getting so old. Mm -hmm. and I'm going, I'm 65. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm 69 now. And I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, I'd love to go back a long way. I'd like to hear um, just about your childhood growing up and maybe what your faith was like back then. How, how did you, um, how did you grow up? Where did you grow up? What was that like for you? Well, I grew up in Andover, Massachusetts, where my dad was chairman of the math department and varsity wrestling coach at Phillips Academy Andover, the largest boys prep school at the time okay. and uh, the oldest. And, um, and uh, it was, um, I grew up in the church, uh, in a church that was congregational and became United Church of Christ okay. when that happened. Um, and like I was eight or something like that when that happened. Mm -hmm. And um, my grandparents, my father's parents had been missionaries to Korea, Presbyterian missionaries. And my uncle was a very well-respected pastor, uh, Presbyterian. and. Um, but there were no Presbyterian churches uh, in Andover, so we went to this congregational church. And I remember having a, 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 a amazingly clear spiritual experience uh, when I was 11. Hmm. I was sitting in church, and, and I had been, that was the Sunday that, that my class had been confirmed. Uh, and um, and I remember sitting there in church and I suddenly, the, the church seemed to be filled with light. Um, and I was seemed to be the only person who could see it, but I was like, just so moved by mm -hmm. it. And so struck in my inner self about it uh, that, that, you know, I look back on it now and I go, oh yeah, clue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. About, about my life to come but mm -hmm. i wanted to be an actor and mm -hmm. uh i wanted to be a musical theater performer a song and dance man on broadway and, and film and tv you know and, and uh so i went to northwestern university and got my under undergraduate degree in theater and and uh had every intention of being an actor but when i got out into the big world of of acting after having gotten leads in every show I ever auditioned for practically. Um, the, uh, the, um, when I got out into the big bad world of professional theater, all the doors kept slamming shut. Mm -hmm. you know, no, I'm sorry. You know, no, 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 no. Yeah. And a couple so a couple years later, um, I was sitting in church. I was going to the MCC in Chicago and Reverend Ken Martin uh, preached an incredible sermon about the woman at the well mm. and how she'd left her heavy water pots behind to go back into her community and, and testify about her experience of Jesus and asking, can this be the Christ? Yeah. And he suggested that we were called to do the same. Mm. And in the, in the prayer time afterwards, before communion, I was just suddenly filled again with this clarity, this light. And I knew in that instant that I was to be a minister. Hmm. And I completely dropped my dreams of being a, a song and dance man, an actor. And all the doors flew open. I went hmm. to McCormick Seminary where my grandfather had, had gotten his degree. Um, and I got my Master's of Divinity there. So, yeah. so tell me about um, about when you knew that you were different from other boys. Tell me about when you kind of woke up to being gay. Yeah. And then how did that fit into your family and into your faith at the time? Well, I knew that I was different from as far back as I can remember. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't like the other boys that I knew who were all into sports and rough and tumble play mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. I was, I was very content to sit and play the piano. I started playing, taking piano lessons when I was three mm -hmm. and, um, and I loved musicals. My father had the albums for South Pacific and my fair lady. And, and I had the album of the Peter Pan musical with Ray right. Martin. I would play them all over and over and over and over again. Um, and, uh, that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to sing and dance and mm. act. And, um, anyway, so that was not the usual thing for little boys. I was also aware of a very special feeling I had 
at the age of maybe four and five mm. or um you know various different male figures mm -hmm. uh, i i was every time steve reeves was on as hercules i was there watching <laughs> him. i mean yeah. i was fascinated by his body and um i was fascinated by um uh you know just I mean, I was really clear that I wanted men in a way that I didn't want women. Right, right. Um, and that was at a young age, like mm -hmm. five, six years old. And when I when I came into puberty and and started really developing sexually, um, all my thoughts were of men, mm -hmm. and I tried to make them be about women. And I would take my brother's Playboys and and try to uh, you know get into it uh and, um and uh and i just couldn't it just, you know i ended up looking at uh, steve reeves instead mm -hmm. of, you know arnold schwarzenegger well he didn't right. look around yet but um you know the 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 bodybuilders yeah johnny weissmuller oh yeah oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 the loincloth right mm -hmm. yeah um and my dad uh and the varsity wrestling coach would take me to the meets on Saturday sometimes. And I loved watching the boys wrestling. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. was a special charge there. Yeah. And I remember particularly too, at the beginning of before the meet happened that afternoon, they would have to um, weigh in to make sure they were going to fight at the right weight right. and, and um, or wrestle. And, uh, and when they didn't come in, they were a little over my father had them stripped down mm. so come in on and when the boys stripped i those muscular young bodies i was just like oh. and i was five so i mean right. I, you know and i said i must have said something to my father and i wish i knew what it was it was probably something like how do those boys get so muscular Ooh, you know and and uh and he uh you know he instantly told me that that was not something we talked about and mm. uh, he, uh, whatever it was he said he he made me feel ashamed of my right. feelings when I knew mm. that I wasn't supposed to talk about them mm -hmm. I I've heard you tell a story and I read it in the book as well something about uh when you were a little child and you do you remember this story um oh when I was in my high chair yes 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 and, tell that yeah, story my first words uh -huh. Yeah, but my dad and mom would have the wrestling team down for dinner every every year, and uh, and when I was you know maybe eighteen months old, um, they they came down for dinner, and I was in my high chair, and as they started to come in through the through the door, I sat up in my high chair and said, just as clearly as could be, boys, 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 <laughs> and uh, that was their first clue, A uh, foreshadowing there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I didn't know. I don't remember that. I don't. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but my father wrote it in a letter to his parents that I found after he died. Mm. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it was, oh, my God, it was there as far back as 18 months old. Yeah. It was a special charge. Yeah. So was there in your teenage years, uh, was there conflict within you as far as your sexual orientation versus your religious faith? I, you know, I don't really remember anybody ever saying anything in church about mm -hmm. homosexuality. Mm -hmm. I did. I was very, very ashamed of myself and yeah. my sexuality and I hated myself and, and I was so unhappy and mm. I knew I was never, I, you know, anything that I read was about deviance, uh, yeah. you know, in raincoats and back alleys and right. I was like, oh my God, is that what I'm doomed to? And so I went to the pastor of the of the church mm. that we went to and I told him I thought I might be a homosexual. And well he jumped up and started pacing the room and looking at his library like like there was he was gonna find something that would help him with this. Mm. And there wasn't. And he said, Well, I, I've never heard anybody say anything like that before. I'm sure it's just a phase mm. and don't say anything about it to anybody. It could really, really be rough on you if you did. And particularly, don't tell your parents. Mm. Uh, so 
lesson learned. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how did you end up in Chicago going to an MCC church? Tell me about discovering that joyful thing that you could be uh, gay and Christian and, and yeah, worship in this space. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I had uh, developed a drinking problem in college and mm. the first year out of college. I didn't do much other than drink. I didn't go to auditions, but I, I, I was... Uh, spent most of my time sitting alone in my apartment drinking. Um, and uh, when I got sober um, at the age of 23, um, I realized that if I was going to stay sober, I had to do something about um, being gay and mm -hmm. come and come out. Uh, and so um, I went to a gay recovery group and mm -hmm. uh, and somebody, one of the men that I met there said, oh, you should come to MCC. And so he took me and it was a spiritual renewal weekend and Troy Perry was preaching mm. and he scared me to death and I never wanted to return. Uh, and he talked about the New Orleans fire and, and oh, how, yeah. how, you know, so many MCCers, like 30 MCC uh, members died in that fire uh, in the upstairs room, um, ironically. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was a huge tragedy that had just happened a couple years before. And it scared me to death. I also had never heard anybody preach like Troy. Mm -hmm. I mean, Troy is a really, you know, exciting storytelling. Uh, Do you love the Lord? Then say amen, you know? And, yes. I mean, he gets the he gets the congregation really going, and you know, I'd never heard anybody preach like that. Uh, my my preachers were all pretty academic, and yeah. Uh, anyway, so um, but uh, my friend persuaded me to come back and hear the pastor of the church, Ken Martin, and uh, I did the next Sunday with my friend, and um, I really loved it. I lo I loved his preaching. I loved the service. I love the people that I met. I saw a lot of people who were living happy lives and in mm. relationships, loving mm -hmm. relationships. And I wanted what they had. So mm. I joined the choir and I kept going, you know, yeah. until I heard the call. And well, I, I kept going after that too, but I, yeah. I stayed in the seminary. Yeah. And is McCormick in Chicago? Yeah, it is. It's a Presbyterian seminary. Okay. Located down at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. part of the cluster of theological seminaries there. And then what brought you to Los Angeles? Ah, well, first I went to Hartford. When I graduated mm. from McCormick, uh, okay. I, I, it was, uh, uh, I, I was called to be the pastor of MCC Hartford. And there I started doing a lot of interviews about being gay and Christian. Mm. Okay. And, and so that was 1979 to 82. Mm -hmm. And then in 82, I just wasn't feeling very well. Mm -hmm. And I had developed, a, a, in, in, in April, I had developed this really awful cracked coating on my tongue that went mm -hmm. down my throat. And, and uh, the doctor in the clinic I went to said, oh, it's just an indication of some virus on board. But indeed, we know now that, that was the first indication, the first symptom of uh, HIV that I experienced. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I had a lot of friends in Los Angeles. I always wanted to live there. So I moved there and, um, I went to see Dr. Joel Weissman because I wasn't feeling well. Mm -hmm. And he diagnosed me with grid gay related mm -hmm. deficiency. That's what they were calling AIDS back right. then. And this was what, 1982? Yes. 19 early, not early. I, I, I had the thrush, uh, in 19, in April and, uh, Dr. Weissman diagnosed me with GRID in like September. Okay, I think it was. So, um, yeah. So I was, I was, uh, you know, I was terrified. And over the next year, I developed uh, horrible illnesses and just was sicker than I'd ever been in my life. I had hepatitis, cytomegalovirus, pneumonia, mononucleosis, herpes, shingles, mm. strep throat. Um, uh, oh, just a horrible fungal infection on my mm. right foot, which bubbled away for nine months. No dermatologist Gosh. seemed to be able to do anything mm. about it. And the one dermatologist that, that I went to 
the longest actually, said that he hadn't seen anything like this since he was a medic in the South Pacific in World War II, hmm. and that it was a fungal infection uh, caused by walking barefoot in sheep dung hmm. in New Zealand. And I had never done any of that. Right. So And so he said, uh, and I told him that, of course, and, and he said, it's a shame what's happening to you gay men. Hmm. You know, so at that time we were reading headlines about, you know, this awful disease that was right. killing gay men. Right. Um, I don't know. What was, what was that like in your community at that time? I mean, things were just starting to, to come out about this new scary disease. Did right. you know other people who were seeming to be infected with it at that point? Or were you the no, first? I was the first. And, and I was the first member of the clergy and MCC to be diagnosed. Um, and uh, it scared everybody to mm. death because mm -hmm. I had this reputation for being rather vanilla. Mm. You know? And there had been this feeling that, oh, the guys who, the guys who get it are like, you know, very promiscuous and right. you know, maybe into leather or, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and here I was just as vanilla and New Englandy as I could be. Mm. And, uh, um, and I had it. Uh, yeah. And uh, people were scared to death of me. I mean, uh, I couldn't find anybody to bring me communion for months. Wow. And finally, I found somebody, uh, a, a woman who was a deacon at MCC in the Valley in North Hollywood. And uh, she she brought me communion, but she was terrified. You can mm. I can tell when she came in my house, she she really worked at not touching anything and staying mm -hmm. distant from me. And she had me serve myself. She didn't wow. even want to put the wafer on my tongue as we usually do at at uh, MCC. Yeah, and uh, and you know I understood. We didn't know how it was transmitted. Right. So the fear was just awful. And particularly among gay men, and I was a walking symbol of everything that they were most afraid of. Mm -hmm. So all my gay male friends just kind of disappeared. And right. it was lesbians who took care of me in the early years. Mm -hmm. And then in April of 84, I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma and Kaposi's sarcoma. And that confirmed that I had full-blown AIDS, mm -hmm. um, even though I'd already been diagnosed with GRID uh, two years previous. Um, and um, so uh, anyway, that's when I was given eight months to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, the and you know the the wonderful gift that I got from Reverend Ken Martin, who was now the pastor of MCC in the Valley in North Hollywood. Uh, he in uh, I, the Easter was two weeks after I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma and KS, and he invited me to preach the Easter sermon, and wow. I said you mean good friday don't you i'm dying and he said no you need to preach easter and it was the best gift anybody could have given me right then because i had to look at what it meant to believe in the resurrection of jesus christ as wow. a person facing death from this horrible stigmatized mm. wow yeah i was reading about that in the book about that that momentous Easter Sunday morning. I mean, this is two weeks, you said? Two weeks after two weeks. this diagnosis? Yeah. yeah. Tell me what that was like for you that morning. Well, um, you know, I had prepared a sermon uh, that was, I had written out most of it because mm -hmm. I was nervous about delivering it. And I wanted to get it just right. And and when I got into the pulpit and started reading it, I, I, I suddenly realized, no, you know, I just need to talk. Mm -hmm. And so I threw my notes in the air and, and uh, said, I know what to say. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. And because I, because G, uh, God was shown to be greater than the death of Jesus on the cross through the resurrection, so if God is greater than Jesus' death, then God is greater than AIDS. Hmm. And the congregation gasped like, oh my God, how hmm. could you say that? I mean, everybody's dying. And I said, no, God is greater than AIDS. And fortunately, my doctor, who is still my doctor to this day, Dr. Alexandra Levine, hmm. 
she told me when I, when she diagnosed me with the lymphoma and KS, she said, not everybody is going to die from AIDS. And if one in a million survive it, why not believe that you're going to be that one in a million mm -hmm. and act accordingly? And the Easter message told me that I could do that, that mm -hmm. I could believe that God was still in the healing business and that I could get well. And even if I didn't, I was going to be fully alive, even in the face of death. Yeah. I, you know, I discovered that in spite of them having told me the worst thing they could possibly tell me at the age of 32, um, that I could still dance. Mm. I could still, uh, you know, enjoy my friends. I could still laugh and, and be, be fully alive, even with this horrible disease. Wow. That's such a beautiful, strong embodiment of that resurrection power. That is so yeah. inspiring. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear kind of about your ministry since then. I mean, I know that's a very long time. Thank God you've been right. still with us for 37 years beyond that point. So talk to us a little bit about kind of your activism and, and the ways that God has used your ministry at this intersection of AIDS and Christian faith? Well, um, I, had, I had very quickly become uh, uh, an activist. Uh, I, I went to AIDS Project Los Angeles to become a client, and uh, they looked at my experience and said, we're going to put you to work. And so I started doing interviews, and um, I started, uh, you know, calling all the people with AIDS in Los mm -hmm. Angeles whose names and began last names began with M through Z. Mm. And, you know, I could do that in two hours and have a nice talk with each of them. There just mm -hmm. there weren't that many of us back then. Wow. But um, that began and I realized that I I had a lot that I, I had a lot to give in terms mm -hmm. of uh, an ordained clergy person. Um, and uh, so I started giving all I could and being of service. Uh, I, I was appointed to all kinds of different task forces and boards and mm -hmm. uh, Southern California um, Interfaith Network on AIDS um, and, uh, you know, various things like that. And I was usually the person with AIDS on the mm -hmm. board of the task force. Wow. And, uh, so that put me in a position of doing a lot of interviews and, and talking about it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I was, um, I was kind of stopped from doing a lot of that because or I, yeah, I was on, I was, I was patient number one, the first patient on an antiviral drug, the first antiviral drug they tried against HIV, mm. uh, the drug called Suramin. Yeah. And, um, Within six weeks, all of my KS lesions had disappeared and my lymphoma was in complete remission. Wow. And they both remain in complete remission to this day. Thank God. They are considered cured. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank God. Exactly. Yeah. And, but unfortunately, Suramin proved to be very toxic. After the success with me, they put 89 other people on the drug around the country and it killed a large mm -hmm. percentage of them. It was yeah. such a rugged drug. And everybody else died from AIDS mm -hmm. except one uh, within the next year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, it very nearly killed me. Um, and my adrenal glands blew out, which they mm -hmm. didn't detect until it was almost too late. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was in the midst of doing that, two weeks after I had died clinically from the adrenal insufficiency, that I did the interview with Tammy Faye. Right. Can you talk about that that near death or death experience that you had two weeks prior to that interview? Because I think sure. that's a really powerful story too. Yeah. Um, well, I I was uh, I was very very sick. I was sleeping like twenty hours a day and mm. couldn't eat anything. I had wasted away to nothing, and my cancers were still in remission. So it was obviously the ceramin mm -hmm. uh, that was doing this. So they brought me into the hospital when they finally figured out that my adrenal glands had failed and that I was, you know, without adrenal glands, you die. And mm. uh, so um, I came into the hospital and uh, this was County Hospital 
in LA, which is a mess. You know, it's it's hard to back then, particularly it was really hard. Mm. And uh, they lost me in triage, you know, mm. for a long time. And, and they finally got me into uh, the the red blanket room, the uh, where they you know worked up each patient that came in. Um, they had hooked me up to, you know, IV and drugs and all that. And they were trying to draw blood from my arm. And, um, and I had this consciousness of, of uh, myself, my soul leaving my body. Yeah. And I was looking down on the scene and she's and the nurse said, pump your hand, Steve, pump your hand. Uh, Cause the blood wasn't flowing anymore. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I wondered why I wasn't pumping, why he wasn't pumping his hand. And then I just uh, didn't care because I was surrounded by love. Mm. Um, there was this brilliant light, which gave me great peace. I felt this peace that I had never felt before. And uh, it, it was a peace that passes all understanding, literally. Mm. And um, I understood my life and i understood all the things that i really didn't understand mm. and there was that wholeness that wholeness of understanding and compassion and love and peace and and then i was back in my body and i was pissed <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i bet oh uh, yeah and uh and they you know i recovered from mm -hmm. that well enough to do the interview with tammy Fay. yeah uh, but um that was a powerful experience. And I had gone into it terrified of dying and terrified specifically of dying alone. Mm -hmm. But I did just that. I mean, I didn't have anybody I knew around me at the time. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that that doesn't matter because mm -hmm. there are all these loving beings. The love that you have experienced is in you and is eternal. Wow. Um, and, uh, and you know what really i came back from that realizing that what really matters is looking in each other's eyes and really seeing each other mm. seeing the soul seeing the heart of the other who god loves mm -hmm. whom god loves yeah wow yeah that's amazing i've been reading a book called after by a guy named dr bruce grayson and he's talking about near-death experiences and and that is is like a lot of what people describe and that's such a hopeful amazing story i'm really encouraged by that um i was going to ask you about tap dancing for shirley mclean and elizabeth taylor oh right <laughs> tell me about that story well um uh in 19 in in 1985 about four weeks before the tammy Faye experience um there the first entertainment industry event for AIDS, uh, against AIDS, mm -hmm. was held. And it was a huge dinner held in a banquet hall the size of a, several football fields, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and Elizabeth Taylor planned it and chaired it. And her best friend, Rock Hudson, was dying mm -hmm. in the hospital right. in UCLA at the time. Right. Um, he would die two weeks, two or three weeks later. Wow. Um, and... Um, so uh, I was asked to be the person with AIDS who spoke. I was the client representative on the board of directors at APLA mm -hmm. by that time. Mm -hmm. And um, they knew that I had public speaking experience from all the preaching and everything. So they invited me to be the person with AIDS who spoke. And so um, Shirley McLean introduced me. At the rehearsal the night before, I met all of these huge stars who were going to be part of the, the, the ceremony and mm -hmm. the event. And um, Burt Lancaster and I mm -hmm. hit it off, uh, <laughs> and with, which was just delightful. And, yeah. uh, and Elizabeth was uh, always so supportive of me and just very loving and caring and passionate mm -hmm. about, you know, finding the answer, finding the cure to AIDS. Yeah. Um, and she was quite a powerhouse and real down to earth and fun and funny, mm -hmm. and all those good things. Shirley MacLaine, uh, when I, when she introduced me, um, you know, I came up on the stage and 
she embraced me and and uh, whispered in my ear, "Just tell them your truth. Just tell them your truth, Reverend." Mm. And and I did, and I talked about how they told me the worst thing they could possibly tell me, and I could still dance. And I shuffled off to Buffalo in front of Hollywood. Where I got the nerve to do that, I don't know. But I, I love uh, it. It's it's like your childhood dream of of being yeah, in it a was song a dance man. It was happening exactly. exactly. Yeah. Shirley MacLaine came back on the stage and and uh, gave me a big hug and said, "Oh, that was perfect, mm. perfect, Reverend, and thank you." And and so that was really cool. And I've run into her several times since, and and we always look at each other like, uh huh, uh huh. And once she, I I told her that I had survived this near death experience, and or that I was doing very well. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Have you had a near death experience?" And I said. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. And she said, that's what I'm learning is that all the people who are surviving AIDS beyond the expected uh, prognosis are people who've had near-death experience, mm. out-of-body near-death Wow, wow. And I was, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never seen that or heard that, but, you know, okay. Hmm. Uh, that's what Shirley MacLaine said and okay. really believed. Yeah. 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 Tell me about the the Smithsonian and the oh right the inclusion well, of the the fairy wand. You might need to tell us a story about fairies. Oh, okay. Well, you know, Peter Pan was always my favorite fairy tale, uh, and that's not a fairy tale, but it has fairies in it. Yeah. And Tinkerbell uh, mm -hmm. specifically is dying at one point in the play, and and uh, uh, Peter turns to the audience and says, "People." Uh, Tinkerbell is dying because people don't believe in fairies. If you believe in fairies, clap your hand and bring and clap your hands and bring Tinkerbell back to life. And of course, for a century, people have been applauding like crazy, and Tinkerbell comes back to life, and the play goes on. Um, and I took that as uh, a metaphor for what we were going through with AIDS. There were so many good fairies, including myself, who were who were dying. Yeah, and um, you know, we needed to believe in ourselves and believe in each other to do the work of healing, whether that mm. was healing into life or healing into death. And I would carry my big, big old fairy wand with me into the pulpit or wherever I was speaking in conferences uh, to talk about that and to, you know, make people remember it with a prop, you know, mm -hmm, prop, mm -hmm. props help. So um, fast forward to 2019 and Troy Perry was invited to contribute uh, stuff from uh, MCC's history into the Smithsonian's uh, collection. And uh, um, and he invited me, he, they had asked him if, if he knew anybody with, who was an AIDS ministry person who could contribute. And, and he said, oh, have I got somebody for you? Because I had been doing AIDS ministry for many years at that point. And I, I, I um, put together a box full of, um, including that book, um, mm that you showed mm -hmm. and uh, the, the videotape of Tammy Faye and me or a DVD of it. And, um, and the last minute uh, before I had to take the box to Troy to mail off to, to the people there, um, I looked at my fairy wand on my shelf and I said, should I? No, I, I mean, it means so much to me. I got to keep it on my shelf. And then I thought, keep it on my shelf where it's gathering dust or put it in the Smithsonian. Hello. <laughs> so <laughs> off it went to the Smithsonian and sure enough, the curators at the Smithsonian were most excited about the fairy wand. Wow. One of the, one of them told me that kind of symbolizes exactly what we needed during those years. Mm. Of the worst of it. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow. Well, we're almost to the end of our time together. Oh, wow. This conversation has gone so quickly. Yeah. I'm so thankful for you and your presence. Um, I, I, I've been only out of the closet myself for five and a half or six years. Mm -hmm. And I come from an evangelical background, a very conservative background. And so a lot of times um, I and my friends who are doing this work Sometimes we feel like we're pioneering in this space, right? Yeah. But it's so important to me, and it has been very important to me over the last several years, 
to acknowledge that there have been people for decades, for centuries, doing this work long before I came on the scene. And it is always so profoundly moving and and significant for me mm-hmm. to meet somebody who has been doing this work, who has paved the way for me to be able to come out of the closet at 44 years old, 2016, and find new life, find new ministry, find uh, new relationships. Uh, and and I and my my contemporaries can only do that because people like you have paved the way. And so I'm so grateful. And it's such a joy to to get to know you and to hear some of your story. When I came out in 2016, one of my mentors, uh, Reverend Annie steinberg Berriman, who is now the senior pastor of the MCC San Francisco. And oh. she invited me to uh, to work at that church for nine months. I was the uh, music director. And so I kind of got to dive into the world of MCC yeah. and get to know yeah. some people in the San Francisco um, church and, and the Bay Area. And it has been uh, uh, such a cool thing. And I've been so, so thankful uh, to know that I'm not alone. I am surrounded yeah. by a great cloud of witnesses who yeah. have gone before yeah. me and who continue to walk with me, you know? Exactly. Exactly. You know, when I when I talk to evangelical Christians who are against homosexuality, and uh, I I like to say, you know, this is a country that believes in freedom of religion, mm-hmm. and I believe that God loves me just the way I am. Yeah. Uh, I believe that Jesus loves me just the way I am, and Jesus loves the way I love, which I said to Tammy all those mm-hmm. years ago. And, and that, uh, you know, who are you to tell me that I'm wrong about mm-hmm. that? I mean, that's what I believe. And I'm free to believe that in this country. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Um, ha. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and God and, don't make junk, you know? That's uh, right. One of the things, you know, I, there, of course there's work to be done, right? I mean, we have to look at those texts in the scriptures and try to figure out how in the world we can understand and interpret them. And so I, I did all that work and lots of us do all that work. But the truth is at the end of the day, what, what convinced me, what gave me peace was seeing God alive and well in queer people, right? Seeing uh, the fruit yeah. of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control in gay believers. Yeah. And I, when I, when my spirit saw that in them, I recognized God, I recognized the Holy Spirit. And I could say, you know what? I, I don't care what, what anyone says. I, I recognize the goodness of God in these faithful queer Christians. And that was, that was what finally helped me step across that line and, and affirm my own sexuality as something good and God given. So I'm so grateful for your testimony and for all of those. That was that was very much the same experience I had when I came to MCC in in the or in the mid seventies. Mm. Um, you know, and so thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. Mm. I'm glad it's still happening for people. It is. It is. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, lots of people are chiming in. I'm just going to just show a couple of these. Uh, this is great. Thank you so much for sharing, says Chloe. Eric Mathis, thanks for sharing your story. Steve, you're doing meaningful and good work. My thanks to you both. So we've had lots of people watching uh, as we've done this interview. And again, I just want to say thank you. In the comments below, I'm going to put the YouTube video. I'm going to put links to a biography of Steve and some other things. So uh, so for those of you who want more, you can also follow Steve um, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and yeah, thanks so much, Steve. I uh, bless you as you go from here into whatever is next. I'm just so grateful for your life and your work. Thanks for being God with bless us. Bless you, Matt. Thank you.